So uh, my name is Christian Witzler and I'm a research assistant at uh, the Jülich uh, Supercomputing Center with the focus on in situ visualization. And uh, that's where the stark talk is coming from. Um, so as a first step, why do we want in situ visualization? And uh, the usual reasons for that are that um, the performance of uh, hard drive storage and um, network performance and CPU performance don't develop in the same speed. So um, network and CPUs are way faster in, in, in relation to um, storage devices than they were um, uh, some, some time ago. And therefore, the simulations can be slowed down by, by writing the output files to, to disk or have to discard um, variables to, to reduce the load on the, on the storage system. And um, one tool to reduce that is in situ visualization. But uh, in situ visualization is not always easy. That's uh, why we're trying to make it easier for, for people to use it so that it's not as, not as much work, basically. So um, first, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of uh, motivation um, what, what we actually want. In, in our special case, uh, or in also more general case on in, in situ visualization that we're setting up here. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the design decisions um, that I took to accomplish the, um, those goals. Um, in special, um, in, 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 in more detail, I will go into Sensei, Adios 2, and uh, Paribu Catalyst, because those were the choices that, that I made. And uh, later on, I will show you a little bit about um, how to use it to um, ho hopefully back up my claim that it's uh, going to be easier, um, which will be three steps from, for the simulation like uh, PDA, PDI integration, then the uh, um, general file that you use to um, inform PDI what to do, and lastly, a little bit about Catalyst. So um, yeah, the, what do we need? What do we want? So we want in situ realization, but uh, we want it with uh, minimal dependencies for the simulation code. So um, we don't want to have, uh, for example, if you include Paraview directly into a simulation code, we have lots of simulation, um, lots of um, uh, libraries that Paraview needs and that's, that are linked directly to your simulation code. And of course, those could cause problems in a multitude of ways. And therefore, it's, it's nice to have that a little bit more separated. In, in kind of the same uh, reasoning goes for, we want to have an error resistant visualization. So we don't want to have some misconfigurations visualization or some errors in the visualization code or something like that, or the, the use visualization tool, which of course are huge libraries as well. And therefore not, you can't be sure that everything is running correctly. So we want that to be as error resistant as we can make it so that, for example, the uh, visualization having problems doesn't influence your simulation, at least not more than not having the visualization anymore for that time frame, at least. And um, yeah, and, and more general, we don't we want to uh, reduce overall influences on the simulation as far as we can. And um, yeah, on the right side, you can see um, an overview of uh, everything that is considered uh, basically um, in situ. And there's like a, a multitude of uh, different categories where different uh, solutions to in situ uh, have like different properties where you can kind of sort them in. And um, um, we want in transit um, visualization. Um, for the first like uh, like uh, decision made here, um, because that means um, that we transport the data we want to visualize visualize visualize, visualize to a different node before we do anything else. Therefore, the the influence on the simulation, besides transferring the data over the network to some other nodes, are minimized because we don't have something running on the same node that needs uh, additional memory. Um, that uh, needs CPU times and uh, uh, at least not on the same node. And just therefore, it's, if we use in transit, it's, it's more decoupled. And therefore, um, the influence on the simulation um, gets uh, further reduced. So, um, yeah. Then the first design decision made, basically, is Sensei. Because uh, Sensei is... Uh, a really flexible in between layer basically for in, in, in situ uh, um, solutions. And uh, for example, you can 
connect later on to Adios, to Catalyst, to Visit, and a multitude of other uh, tools that are available for Adios, um, not for Adios, sorry, for Sensei. And um, therefore, it, for example, allows in transit um, visualization as well. And um, on the right side, you can see kind of like uh, the uh, where we are locked in now. So um, we that is um, in, in depend in form from uh, what we how we exit is where it's running, and um, it's but it's as you can see it's still quite flexible. So um, because it's, it's supposed to be a more general solution, um, it's it's hard to to fix users to to one um, solution and. Um, this allows us to um, be be more flexible and still allow users uh, to to change it later on without much work because Sensei allows it. Of course, you need to have uh, the different tools you can connect Sensei to. For example, Adios. If you want to use Sensei with Adios, the build version of Sensei that you're using um, has to be connected to Adios and on uh, in build time, but um, you can, for example, change different Sensei versions um, with my with my tool, and uh, therefore, for example, change one in where you have Adios, and then change one in where you have Catalyst, or change one in where you have both of them, depending on on your needs, without uh, having to to really change anything, uh, besides maybe some configuration if you are using something different. Um, but uh, one thing we are missing with Sensei is that we don't have uh, built-in data transport. And uh, that's where we are using Adios 2 as a data transport mechanism. And um, we're using Adios 2, uh, and in specific, we are using SST, which stands for stands for Sustainable Staging Transport um, as a data transport mechanism. So Adios 2 allows different ways to transport data, but that's the one we are choosing because it scales really well. It allows end-to-end -end communication. Therefore, we don't have to have the same number of of nodes in our simulation running as we have in our endpoint where we send the data. So this is basically the, 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 the place where the data gets sent to, to actually do the visualization or analysis, analysis that you want to do. And that's your simulation and you don't have to have the same amount of num nodes running there. So for example, you could run a simulation with 100 nodes and just use 10 for your visualization, depending of course on, on, on your needs uh, on in, in respect to memory and uh, CPU time that you need. Um, well, and a couple of advantages of the SST transport is in special is that it's really simple to use. So we can set it up basically for 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 the end user without much 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 trouble. Um, it scales well, and uh, it uses a remote direct memory access. So it's yeah, it's it's it has overall good performance. But um, one thing that's that's a downside, or at least a little bit, is that uh, it creates itself a configuration file that you have to have both sides point to. So that's it's using a file to set up the uh, initial um, uh, RDM, uh, RDM, RDMA communication. Um, therefore, you need to have a shared file system between um, the, um, the system that's running the simulation and the system that's running the endpoint. But uh, I think that's in most cases not such a huge constraint. Therefore, that was the decision made to to use it. So and and lastly, like for for the uh, actual in, in situ visualization, we are using uh, Paraview or more specifically Catalyst, which is their um, in situ um, library, and um, we can use it for for visualization. And we we're using it because it can be run in parallel. Because if you're having big simulations, which is where the use case of in situ is, because if you don't have really big simulations, then the uh, storage time overall doesn't take that much resources from your project. And um, so we need to run it in parallel because if we just, if our visualization can't do more than 10 gigabytes of data uh, um, in visualizing that, then it's not really useful. So we need to run in parallel for one, for the uh, needed CPU resources and for the, um, that we have enough main memory on for the visualization because if uh, we don't have enough main memory, um, we can't really visualize it. And uh, it's it's um, really useful because it allows two ways to actually interact with your data. One is uh, we can uh, predefine visualization scripts and then just output uh, 
files with uh, pre-processed data or with, uh, with uh, completely done images, for example, and just write the images because, well, you, of course, you can save a couple of hundred pictures uh, with, with high resolution without any problem um, if you compare the size that it's after all with a whole um, data set, for example. And um, the other way is to um, interact with live, have an interactive live visualization so you can connect with your um, uh, with, a, with your catalyst simulation right away and then um, basically see the data as new data is coming in and uh, set up your visualization and change it around and, and, and uh, turn it and zoom in and uh, whenever new data is available you will get an updated uh, picture so that's both ways and you can use both ways in, in parallel depending on, on your needs and uh, one one nice thing that we like uh, that i personally like is that we uh, have integrated uh, paraview uh, in our jupyter jsc and therefore you can use it right from from your browser and connect basically your catalyst enabled simulation or in this case through my my framework enabled uh, simulation and uh, do your interactive live visualization even in your browser so depending on, on your use case, it's, it's always nice to, to have that available at least. <clears throat> so um, now an overview of the design that we are actually running later on. So um, I promised easier in situ visualization. This doesn't really look much easier, uh, but we will get to that. So um, in, the, in the first step, of course, you have your simulation code. And um, to the simulation code, PDI is coupled where we're using PDI to Sensei to communicate the data with Sensei where we are using then Adios 2 to communicate the data using RDMA over uh, the network to a different job. So those are two jobs running, um, which then uses Adios 2 as an input, gives it back into Sensei. And then, for example, we can use Catalyst to um, do our, to generate, uh, generate our visualization and save our pictures or connect to a PV server that we can use for uh, interactive live visualization which of course could be run on a third job depending on, on your needs. Um, but of course, then you have another network transfer, but then it's, it's even more decoupled. And so we're having uh, on two places Sensei, so we are keeping really flexible because of course um, you can change up that you, that you don't use Adios 2 here, but rather straight away go to Catalyst or to Libsyn or to any of the other available Sensei um, outputs basically. Of course, then you don't have uh, uh, in transit visualization depending on, on the tool you're using and what you're doing. And then you have the risk at least of, of uh, higher um, influence. But um, of course, you can still use Adios here and then we have Sensei again. And you still are flexible to use one of the different available visualization libraries and output your data. And this decoupling is, in my opinion, really, really useful. Because, for example, um, if, this, if you're using Paraview and Catalyst and you're doing your visualization and you have a really structured grid, that's not much overhead for your data. And then you are using Paraview to set up some visualization pipeline and you're not aware, uh, for example, that your um, the output of the first filter that you're using in Paraview is an unstructured grid. And if it's on the same node, that's going to be a huge additional memory need, um, which depending on how much could either crash just uh, catalyst or depending on um, on on the uh, the um, operating system maybe it's killing the simulation to save some memory because catalyst is active in that moment or something like that and that's something i i would generally try to to get as far as far away from as possible therefore um, the in transit uh, solution here and uh, i promised you that it's going to be easier so that's uh, what we're looking at next. So what do you have to do if you actually want to do to use it? So there's basically only three places where you have to do some configuration on, on your on your code and what you have to provide basically. So one is um, we have to have the interface between uh, PDI and the simulation. Um, I, I can't take that away from you. Some And in some way we need to get access to your data and uh, you need to provide and include PDI as a library into your code so that we can then later on use everything that's coming behind that. So um, that's the first step you have to do, but depending on, on your on your use case and what you're doing, maybe you actually have that already done because 
uh, you did it for for file IO or you want to have some new file IO and then you can <clears throat> use this integration of PDI into the uh, simulation and get multiple um, outputs available and, and one of them is in situ visualization. Um, the next one is you have to specify um, in the um, specification file for PDI how to uh, an end that you, that you want to use PDI to Sensei and how to use it, um, which is basically where, where I'm mostly working on that it's as easy as possible and um, is straightforward. So um, uh, I will show an example of, of how the code for that could look later on. And um, the last one is I don't know what kind of visualization you want. So I don't know if you want to have volume rendering, if you want to see your velocity, if you want to have streamlines or something like that. So if you want to have pictures, you have to provide the, the catalyst script to actually do that because I maybe maybe it's possible uh, if you as a doctor thesis or something to get some kind of automatic visualization. But I think you know what you want to see in, in your uh, um, in your code where the interesting stuff is probably happening and um, how you can best visualize that. And uh, that's therefore that's basically where you have to have the configuration. Of course, this configuration can be really small. If you just say, well, I just want to have interactive live visualization and then I visualize it, my data while it's running. And then you just have to specify that you want to connect to a PV server uh, and then you can do your, uh, your visualization live while the simulation is running. Um, yeah. So. Um, how can we actually use it? Um, I'm not sure how uh, comfortable everyone is with PDI and how, how far you, you know about it. So um, for, for this use case, we basically need, uh, you can use events and uh, data shares and use the events to, to initialize, to update, and, and, uh, when we want to, up to update it for every time step, for example, and then a finaliz finalization step to shut down everything correctly. <clears throat> which is pretty pretty straightforward and the names because you have to do the connection later on yourself the names don't have to be those names so if you have like an mpi uh, in um, in it in there or something as a pdi event you can use it as well and don't have to to add a different event with a different name so um, that's still quite quite uh, flexible for you um, but of course, if you're only doing it for in situ, then having names such that are telling is always useful. And then in the next step, you have to um, ex give access to PDI to your data so that we can access uh, your, the memory of your simulation uh, to, to read the data um, through PDI, which could be done, for example, for using a multi-expose where you can expose multiple fields and even have a event name here, which of course could be then update in Z2, depending on when you want to actually do it, for example. Um, and that's getting passed on. And uh, if you have those, so if you have your expose and uh, events that, that are named and uh, placed on the correct places in your simulation, um, those names, if that's enough, then you don't even have to rebuild your simulation to actually get uh, this to work. So then the next step is to actually connect it, which is done in a jamble file um, that's that's passed to PDI. And this is like a short example where we where we tell well if you have an init event, we want to have uh, the size of our simulation, the offset. So if you have uh, multiple um, nodes, so we know where each uh, of our data fields is starting. Um, transfer to with this code so that's uh, we can use it and then we just have to um, do some imports and um, set up our bridge which is basically our connection tell it where which file to use to communicate with the uh, second with the endpoint uh, so this is the same file that you basically use in the second job and then as at a mesh for example here image data the VT, vtk image data uh, with the uh, predefined function by me so that's easier of course you can uh, add any um, mesh that you want to add uh, that is uh, that you are able to to uh, do with vtk for some of them i have like easy functions to use for some of them you have to dig into vtk yourself because it's there's some specialized uh, meshes and it's really hard to give, give like uh, one function and you you get them um, yeah and that's basically is it 
Um, of course, this is only possible in this way if the mesh isn't changing. If you if uh, uh, if the mesh is changing every time step because you have like some mesh refinement or stuff like that, you have to update your mesh here as well. But in a simple case where your mesh stays uh, constant, we can then uh, in our update in situ event where, you, where we get the new field data and for example a timestamp, uh, we can add that um, to our bridge, um, have a filter in there that because you don't maybe don't want to. Uh, actually uh, transmit this special field every time step, but maybe just every tenth, give it a name, and then at the end we just say, will we update, and this is the time, and that's basically it. So that leaves us only with uh, the catalyst script that you need to provide, which, uh, for example, um, could be could be done with, if you want to have like interactive live visualization, then you just tell it, well, do live visualization, basically. And uh, that's it, and then you have live visualization. Or you want to use um, it uh, catalyst to to write uh, directly to VTK data. There's um, an example here, which is uh, the first part at least of it, where you just go through all your fields and write all of them in the uh, matching in the matching uh, VTK format uh, to to file. Of course, when we still have the file writing. Now it's on a different node, so therefore your simulation can run and process for the next time steps as well. But of course, we, we are still then uh, back to uh, just using uh, the being bottlenecked by the by the uh, disk space. So maybe that's not not the ideal solution. And um, if you want to have like a more specialized uh, um, script, for example, that you can use as Catalyst to actually to get pictures that that fit your visualization, it's Paraview really provides a nice tool for that. So um, as you can see on the right side, uh, you can, for example, just connect with a small um, example simulation and then um, use the interactive GUI and interactive uh, um, updates and stuff like that to just uh, use uh, to just set up your visualization pipeline. And then later on, you can just export the Catalyst script. Um, of course, you can do the same if you have like a small sample size, and then you can read that and then uh, set up your pipeline and then export a catalyst script as well. Of course, the data types have to fit. So if you use my simulation to set up your visualization pipeline and I'm using some different data, for example, I'm, I'm using a regular grid and you're having unstructured, your simulation actually puts out unstructured grids, and um, then of course, it might not work. So I'm, I recommend using something from your simulation that's that's fitting and uh, there's uh, some one thing you have to uh, look look out for um so um and the exports exported script for catalyst sometimes um if you zoom in somewhere or something like that um the actual coordinates uh, appear there therefore if you just made your small sample simulation of a small sample file with um with a smaller um, setting of your data and not the overall data with a lower resolution, for example, um, then the actual Catalyst script could zoom somewhere where you don't actually want to zoom. So maybe, so I would recommend going through the script later on and seeing if there are any hard-coded coordinates or something like that in there to um, change that to a more flexible style at least. So uh, in summary, what we get is we have millimeter dependencies on the simulation side, so we only need uh, PDI, uh, all other dependencies are indirect and not directly loaded into a simulation. Um, then we have in transit simulation, uh, um, transit visualization, sorry, um, so that the visualization is as independent as we can make it. And uh, in my opinion, the configuration is uh, using PDI's GML file uh, really simple because there's just some simple, simple functions that you have to, to connect in a in my opinion, straightforward way, but uh, maybe we are, have a different opinion there. And then, uh, that's always valuable feedback for me. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, is there any question, Christian? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we know yes. you. Uh, okay, I have a couple of questions. First, just because it's not 100% clear, you do when on the PDI, so on the application side, you do data transformation, you, you, you transform the data into a VTK compliant, uh, let's say, uh, data structure, or this is done, let's say, on the server uh, outside of the application? We need to have VTK uh, compatible data so that IDEOS, for example, can do the uh, 
end-to-end communication, it needs to be able to understand the data and therefore it needs to be uh, VTK data before it goes into, uh, um, into Sensei basically. So um, there is some transformation, but in the easiest case, for example, if you have a structured grid, that's just saying, well, we are starting at zero, zero and uh, we're going and we have like 100 elements in, in each of the three dimensions. And uh, here's a pointer to, to the array where we have the, the, the velocity saved in there or something like that. And then you don't actually have to redo a transformation. It's just that it's understanding the data correctly then. If you are having some more complicated, something like an unstructured grid, and your variables are all over the place because you're using linked lists inside your simulation, then you would have to do a transformation probably. Okay. And, and I know that the, in, in the US, they're working so around the Sensei initiative. There, there is this ECP project and with VTKM and Ascent and these kind of things. I don't know yeah. if you're aware of that. Yes. So you, you, you went for Adios. Did you got a chance to like evaluate both solutions? And so if so, why you went for Adios rather for something that would be based on Ascent or a bit different solution? Um, well, as, as far as I'm aware, Ascent isn't really like for the data transport. It's it's more like an, an endpoint, which then could be done in the, let me show it, like down, down here, you could go into Ascent and then um, um, analyze your data with Accent here. We're using Adios 2 here mainly for the data transport because, well, for one, it's, it's understanding the data. Therefore, we have like uh, can have different number of, of jobs running in our um, endpoint for the uh, in transit transport and our simulation codes. Um, that's, that's one of the main advantages, in, in my opinion. And and you can use Accent down here as well. And of course, that's just basically the default. So if you have like a strong reason to use Accent up here as well, you are able to. So um, I, I and I, I choose Adios 2 here because I'm not aware of uh, Accent being able to do the data transport. And uh, uh, so far, Adios 2 has uh, really good performance in the data transport in minimal tests. Therefore, I didn't see a reason to switch it. But um, one of the advantages of, of Sensei basically is it's, it's really easy to switch and you don't have to do recompilations and uh, change your code if, for example, uh, Catalyst is having a new interface. You just have to have it there, and then you, it's just two lines. And then you're using Accent in, instead of Catalyst or Adios if you if you want to. Okay. Thank, thanks for your answer. Very helpful. Hello. I have also a, a quick question. Michel yes. Westin from Seneho. Um, I was wondering. I, I suppose Sensei also offers some interfaces API. Uh, what are the advantages of the uh, PDI interface that you have developed compared to, I suppose, the original one available in Sensei? What does it provide for you? Um, for me, it, it's it's providing an, an easy way to access uh, the data directly and um, not having to have uh, Sensei with the dependencies. Because, for example, if you're um, compiling uh, Sensei and you want to use it with, for example, uh, catalyst for uh, for in situ visualization with Paraview, then you have to compile Sensei with um, uh, pointing it to a build directory of Paraview, which is enabled in the right configuration. And then later on, if you um, compile your simulation and link it with Sensei, then those dependencies land up in in inside your um, simulation and uh, libraries that your simulation code actually sees and loads itself, and that's uh, that can complicate your build process, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And um, with having PDI in between, the, the simulation only sees the dependencies of, of PDI and the libraries I need for Sensei and PDI to Sensei are basically loaded uh, dynamically. Therefore, the simulation don't doesn't see them, especially not during the build process. Okay, so the main advantages is to this decoupling during the, the compilation is to improve yes. the... And, 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 other advantage of, of PDI is, um, as far as I'm aware, PDI offers more uh, more file I/O options than than Sensei does, <clears throat> at least directly enabled. Of course, with with a flexible design of Sensei, you could write something yourself for, for whatever data output you want. But as far as I'm aware, PDI offers more in that department as well. And so, if you would only want to have one thing in your simulation, uh, I think PDI is a good choice to to um, enable it and then have uh, HDF5 output and uh, multiple other file formats depending on, on your needs available with just a configuration file that you need to change. 
Okay. And is PDI uh, available on GitHub or somewhere like that? Um, yes, it, it should be. I think uh, there's uh, actually they're on version 1.1 uh, right now, but uh, and it's it's so they have a major release already done, so it should be available, and the code is on, on GitHub available as well. So I, it's it's public. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. But but I'm personally not developing PDI. I'm I'm more behind PDI. I'm I'm using PDI to to enable my stuff. So. And maybe a side question: What is the largest uh, visualization that you could perform with? Uh, uh, with um, the largest visualization I've performed, I think it was uh, over one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always confused with, with, with German because the, the numbers uh, have different. Uh, so ten of ten to the power of nine elements, for example, was no problem. Mm -hmm. Which of course isn't really a really big simulation, but at least it's it's uh, somewhere not not small anymore, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.